Um, next joining the head of innovation at the New York based fintech startup Mobility Finance Capital Incorporated, focusing on tech and policy. She's also a special advisor to Cyber Capital. Please welcome Dr. Christina Story. Thank you so much. Uh, clicker's right over there. The clicker is right over there. And uh, your microphone. Thank you. And this is on. Hello, everyone. I am uh, Christina Story. And I'm uh, really excited to be here. I wanted to say thank you to Raphael and Daniel um, and my new friend, Paul. Uh, nice to meet you. And um, you can see that my talk today is Cash in a Cashless Future. Um, so I'm going to save my comments on people's talks. Um, I will say that I am giving this talk um, again in April to um, the Power of Prepaid Conference, um, which is sponsored by the American Bankers Association in DC. And that's not self-promotion. That's simply to say that it's very interesting to me, and I will get to this, that the same talk can be given to an anarchist, libertarian crowd as can be given to um, a group where I'll be on a stage with MasterCard. So one of the things that um, I will say is that I'm a little bit less nihilistic about the possibility of um, legislative effects, um, partly because I see that we may be all uh, tending towards the same future. So today, I want you to think about Let's say you have a private journal um, or some place where you record your thoughts. Maybe it's paintings, whatever it is. Someone comes to you and says, hi, I want to take a look. Does it matter uh, who asks? And does it matter why? And I want to point out that, of course, uh, writing or painting or any kind of analog recording is really only a tiny step away from what you think what you believe, what you feel. And so issues to do with privacy, which I define as the right to choose to disclose, really matter um, in terms of our most basic rights. Uh, I also want to point out that the answer a little bit to, you know, does it matter who asks and why, um, are related to the reality that if uh, my boyfriend asks, hey, can I read your journal? And I say, why? And they say, what do you mean, why? And I say, no, you can't. If I'm operating in a context of presumed innocence, then my exercise and my choice to disclose is completely different than if uh, I'm operating in the context of suspicion or presumed guilt. And so when we talk about privacy rights, which are a great concern to everybody at this conference, um, and to many other groups. We do really need to think about the larger context of presumed innocence or presumed guilt. I think it's fair to say that most people assume that things like the assumption of innocence, which we've all seen on cop TV shows and so on, right, is written down somewhere, is codified, um, and I think many of us believe that the rights to privacy are likewise codified. One of the things that's interesting is that human rights legislation, um, universal declarations, the US Constitution, they don't encode privacy rights, which is kind of innocent, uh, interesting. Um, and I would venture to say that the reason why privacy rights have always been curtailed um, and derived through practice and, and case law is because it's a very powerful right. It really does undergird things like freedom of thought, freedom of belief, um, and from that freedom of speech. Um, I think the premise of assumed innocence or the idea that if you're gonna cast an accusation, you really have to have some reason um, is so sui generis to pretty much every cross-cultural and cross-temporal system concept of justice that we have not necessarily noticed that since the Patriot Act, we absolutely operate in a presumption of guilt. And that's, that's the case for institutions and entities and structures 
that impose upon us, but I would also venture to say that most of us at some point, in some way, have internalized this, and it is one of the things that extends to things such as uh, guilty while being black, or guilty while being Arabic. I mean, I think that if we um, are interacting continually with the premise that your money is guilty until you prove that it's innocent, we are operating in a much more pernicious, widespread cultural framework where we assume people and things are guilty. Um, and this really impacts even the ability to exercise any rights of privacy you might have, because you might have them, but by exercising them, you are indicating your guilt to some group, somewhere, in some way. And many of us, while we might hold um, sort of freedom-loving beliefs and so on, are very susceptible to the idea that it is better to constrain the whole in order to prevent the bad actions of one individual, rather than say, you know, we need to keep living in a risk-absorbing society, an anti-fragile society, where we risk that somebody might do something terrible, but it's better for us all to operate on the somewhat um, less nihilistic belief that we can, we can survive it if they do. So I did just want to say some things which I don't necessarily expect to be teaching anybody in this room. They are things that you know, everybody is sort of fluent in by way of discourse. But it is really important when we think about these particular features of, say, Monero or any of the other cryptocurrencies or any of the analog entities that function like cash, we need to think about what does anonymity and fungibility really mean? And I would venture to say that they encode these ideas of innocence and privacy as a neutral act, right? Cash does not keep a record of who had it before and who has it after, and it doesn't, at this point, require you to explain when you use it in forms that are continued to be sanctioned. So again, a lot of these ideas here are not news to anybody in the room. I think we're all pretty familiar with uh, a range of the reasons why uh, a cashless future seems to be sort of semi upon us and barreling towards us at force. Um, there is, you know, a, clearly a desire and need for governments or any other entity, your employer who takes whatever percent, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to tax more efficiently. So if you have transactional records all the time and you have AI, you can do all kinds of fun things. Um, as I've said, I think post-Patriot Act reasoning in general assumes guilt until proof of innocence. A lot of the KYC and AML uh, gestalt systems that we have didn't exist before the Patriot Act. And I keep banging on about this because it's good to have an actual piece of legislation to, to lobby against rather than just uh, the more vague but very real sort of power structures that endure and how power always functions and so on and so forth. Um, I think the surveillance culture we need to always recognize that that's coming not only from the government and the they, but it's also coming from us and the we. We have um, all kinds of commercial models that are based on uh, the usefulness of transactional details and data and so on. Um, and then we have what I reckon are neutral market forces of a desire for ease and speed. Um, and then, you know, just to be really all very classical about it, let's also remember that, you know, it does cost money to print money, to, to maintain it, to administer it. And so some of the reasons why I think central entities are pushing against cash just has to do with basic, you know, it costs more. So protecting cash. Um, I would love to talk more about the endurance of precious metals or other widely uh, held long-term uh, commodity forms of money, diamonds, et cetera. But clearly, we have a future in which those things will continue to have a real presence. Um, here we are at our Crypto Puco, and I'm not going to spend as much time as I will spend in DC talking about all of the various solutions that are being proposed, being developed, um, not just the technical solutions, but also the intellectual solutions um, and the kind of reimagining of uh, a kind of 19th century version of capitalism that's coming from this sector. Um, but I will be talking more about it to the bankers who don't really know as much, per se, as I know. Um, 
One of the things that I'm not sure everybody in this room knows is that there are active legislative steps being taken by the governments or the states to protect cash. So there is recent legislation that has passed in New Jersey which bans cashless stores. Now, Amazon came to our startup with a desire to push back against this, saying, hey, you guys have a prepaid that's totally linked into the cash world. We want to go and tell New Jersey not to do this. Irrelevant. New Jersey passed the legislation, and this week, the New York City Council got together to consider, in a positive form, also banning cashless stores. And I think this is really interesting um, because the primary motivations coming from the legislative entities has to do with an awareness of and a sensitivity towards their uh, constituents who are underbanked and semi-banked and non-banked. There are 100 million Americans with low to no credit file who are underserved, of which 30% are people of color. Now, of course, that means there are 70% of people who are not of color. You know, whichever way you slice your statistics. But clearly, there is some degree of a kind of middle class indulgence or you know, critique the benefit you have of how bad the banking system is, but that presumes you're in the banking system. So one of the things that these progressive agendas want to do is to protect uh, the rights of people who are not even within the banking system. Um, and consequently, we see that, interestingly, uh, solutions, the end solution, or let's not say it's an end solution, but certainly a destination, um, is shared by both libertarians and progressive agendas. Um, and I think there are some other similarities which I, I find only strengthening, which is that when I listen to, in my kind of guise as Bitcoin anthropologist, um, I hear a lot of critiques of corporate capitalism coming out of most of the most interesting crypto projects, uh, the, the content of the white papers. Um, as a historian, and that's what my doctorate is in, I definitely see um, a desire to essentially re revive and retool 19th century capitalist models, which are pre-corporate. Those are cooperative banks, those are mutual insurance companies, those are things where company directors have personal liability, all of the things that a lot of people in this room think are the real good parts of, of capitalism. What's interesting is that if you really drill down below the kind of ugh, useless, big, too big words of socialist, capitalist, good, bad, money, not, you can hear that in the progressive agenda is a similar desire, right? And that the problem that both sides have is with the embodiment of the corporation as a person. Um, if you imagine a health insurance company that was mandated to pay you the policy back, policy holder back, any profits that were made from good underwriting, you have an entirely different model of capitalism and insurance than you currently do. So to me, one of the things that's, uh, that's really interesting is that mainstream powers that be can understand crypto cash better and crypto solutions and the intellectual content of a lot of these movements. And the non-powers that can be can actually, and again, I look forward to talking with Paul, um, think about the ways in which impulse is coming from legislative um, bodies and the idea that actually the art of persuasion does work sometimes. And of course, if you cast a vote in isolation, it means nothing. But of course, you cast it with a knowledge that in aggregate, it has some power, right? So it's really all about the one way to ensure no is to not engage. Um, I think it's worth thinking about how um, much in common what appear to be really disparate groups have, particularly around the protection of the rights that cash encodes. And then the last thing I'll say with my, my few remaining minutes is that I am from Bermuda. We are a very first world country. Our roofs are made of stone. Um, but we experience hurricanes, and the wind blows, and the electricity goes out. I have friends in New Hampshire who are fully operating on underground underground, and there are ice storms. So one of the things that I think about is how important it is just from a competitive advantage point of view, to maintain analog tech solutions and the mastery 
the capacity within the society. Because when the electricity goes out, the guy who knows how to read a map with a compass has a competitive edge. And she might be a chick. Hello, my daughter Ash in the back, who knows how to navigate with a map and a phone. Uh, so that's it. That's me. Um, I thank you for your attention. And uh, I enjoy chatting with anybody afterwards and look forward to the panel. Let's take some questions. Get a winner. Oh, for sure. Um, my question is, does anybody have a coffee? Because um, I should have the frequent buyer uh, card at Starbucks. Anyone? Yes. Where are we at? Hold your hand up high. I just wanted to say that of the talks that I've heard this weekend, yours is just stellar. And this idea of trust and assuming people are criminals needs to be brought out, and I'm so happy that you're bringing this to the so-called you know, conventional banking world, because this is the issue that really needs to be confronted, okay? We are not suspected criminals. We are human beings which have rights, and they need to be respected, and I really appreciate your perspective on this today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for saying that. Um, I think you're right. I think freedom is terrifying because it is actually a series of responsibilities, right? So equality means that being an asshole is equally distributed, right? You don't get a free pass from being a dick just because you have this category or that category, right? So the assumption of innocence is also balanced by the submission to the idea that if you are guilty, somebody has the right to then impinge. I think one of the most interesting things that I learned about so far with my journey with Mocafi is that in our um, conversations with the city of New York, it is clear that, say, de Blasio's regime and others are coming to understand the implications of KYC and AML in that it is impinging on things that they very much want to do. There are municipal ID programs all throughout the United States that are designed for people who have no documentation, crummy documentation, and they are not necessarily non-Americans. These cities and, and communities are saying, hey, come to us, show us what you have, we'll give you a functional ID, we will enable you to come into a system sufficiently to even critique it, okay? But what they have been doing is saying, we will keep no records so that when ICE comes to us, or the feds come to us, or anybody with subpoena power comes to us, we just don't got no records. Now you see institutional government and forces within it saying, yo, here is the situation we've created, and we know we have to keep transactional, documentary, blah, blah, blah. All right, so there's a degree to which the city state can push back. But when they come to someone like Mocafi and say, hey, we want to give our people banking functionality, and I'm there saying, hey, yo, listen, I can do all kinds of things to like, protect the data and so on and so forth, but I cannot prevent our banking partner, Sunrise, or our processor, um, Akimbo, from legally holding documents which are then subpoenable, right? And you, state, need to start wrapping your head around the idea that we could perhaps turn to the crypto community and say, hey, can you guys build us something whereby your ID, your KYC, your AML is encoded in something as secure as possible and a bank, a this or that, can have like a flasher, you know? Take a look, see what's there, be able to validate, hey, I saw it, but not keep a record of it and organize it along a permissioned basis, right? As cryptographically protected as, say, Bitcoin is or any of the other things that function sufficiently like cash. I mean, that is the kind of solution that I think this community could bring to the people who are desperately trying to figure out how to change the law while not full on check, like check, declaring check, check, secession, check, 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 but check, pushing check. back against the law. You know, codification takes time to catch up with social change. It's been true for 2,000 years. So one of the things that's hopeful to me is that I see the same desired outcome in totally different ideological sub-tribes, and if there can be more, Daniel Krawitz talked about small world groups and then random connections. The more we have of those, uh, and the less nihilistic we are, which is just an excuse for doing jack, um, the better. Last question, doctor. 
To, to piggyback on what you just said and what I, what I think I heard in your talk about rather than replacement or anarchists over here and the state over here, it sounds like you're working toward the concept more of things being integrated. So you're a historian, you presumably you said you're a Bitcoin anthropologist, you sort of looked at the patterns of behavior and monetary policy in the past. Where do you, it's a big question, where do you kind of see this, maybe it's too early, um, you know, shaking out in terms of how crypto gets integrated into the financial world? Because I, I agree with you, I don't think it's an either or type of scenario. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I have been reflecting while listening to people here recently, right, is uh, on a couple of features that I, you, Mark Twain said that history rhymes, doesn't necessarily repeat. So I think one of the things is that I'm of an age to have remembered when the Patriot Act came in. And it strikes me that it's very similar to the Napoleonic Wars, um, the point at which the French Revolution really became bloody and awful. Um, and you had some Anarchapoco is so hype I'm trying to tell ya This the event of the year And best vacation ever Ride part of Jeffrey Tucker Just to name a few uh -huh. Get your tickets You don't want to miss it You should roll through Talking politics to health and Self-improvement to investing So many things Not one thing Learn how to live life unchained Yeah Four days vibing on the beach Time to connect All about growth Way more than a conference This is Anarchapoco Yeah Let's go. We ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs>